On Thursday, we learned three new laws about electricity. They were the three laws of the electric charge. Who remembers what one of those laws are in no particular order? Carrie? Uh, okay, okay, that's the, that's, that's the fourth thing. I'm going to put a little star by that and call it uh, law number four, but it doesn't really go with the other three. That's okay that you give me that one, though. That's the law of conservation of charge. And the law of conservation of charge says that you can't create charge, you can't destroy charge, you can, you said you can't get rid of it. Well, you can kind of get rid of it, but it's got to go somewhere, right? It can't just be destroyed into nothingness, which is, I think, what you meant, right? You can't just destroy it. You can't create it. You can't destroy it. But you can transfer it from one object to another, and sometimes it appears to disappear. Like, it looks like it disappears. Just like momentum sometimes can look like it disappears. Just like energy can sometimes look like it disappears. But just like the law of conservation of anything else, the total amount has to remain the same. Um, we did an example on Friday to illustrate uh, one of the applications of the law of conservation of charge. And we'll do a number of illustrations of the law of conservation of charge over the next uh, few weeks here. But I'm going to do another example with you like I did on Thursday. Okay, let's say you get three charges, and those three charges are plus five coulombs, uh, minus, uh, let's say minus two coulombs, and let's say uh, zero coulombs. This third one is, is neutrally charged. And let's say object one touches object number two, and then let's say object two, they separate from each other, then object two touches number three. I want to find out what the total charge is on each of them on each of the individual charges after these events take place. When one touches number two, well look, the total charge between one and two, plus five and minus three, sorry, minus two was a plus three. The charge on each individual one will be 1.5 coulombs. And then the third one, of course, is still going to be zero coulombs because nothing's happened to that. The goal when two charges touch each other is always to balance out. And we're going to assume that they always do balance out, although that's not quite true. If one object happens to be way bigger than another object, then it can hold a lot more charge than the smaller object, right? We're going to assume whenever we do these questions that they're equal size, equal shape, so that they can balance out like they want to. Okay? Plus 5 minus 2 gives me a total charge of plus 3. And that plus 3 divided amongst the two charges that just touched each other, 1.5, 1.5. Now, 2 touches 3. What's the charge on each of 2 and 3 become after those two guys touch each other? What is the total charge between 2 and 3? 1.5 and 0 gives me a total charge of? 1.5. How does that divide up evenly if I have a total charge between the two of them of 1.5? Yeah, 0.75 and 0.75. Is it possible to have 0.75 coulombs? Sure it is. Sure it is. You don't have to have a whole coulomb any more than you have to have a whole kilogram or a whole kilometer per hour. You can easily have a portion of a coulomb. Remember, a coulomb is such a big unit of charge, you can have not just 0.75, you can have a ridiculously small portion of a coulomb. Like, say, the charge of an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. By the way, charge number one hasn't changed, right? It still remains as positive 1.5 coulombs. So the total charge on, the, on each one of them after they touch each other, 1.5, 0.75, and 0.75. Now, whenever I do something like this, I like to do a final little check. I think I'm right. I think I've done this right. I don't think I've made a mistake. But I like to do a little check just to make sure. My little check is to find the total charge in each step to make sure that it remains the same. Plus 5, minus 2, and 0 gives me plus 3. 1.5, 1.5, and 0 gives me plus 3. 1 1.5, 0 0.75, and 0 0.75 gives me plus 3. Okay? I must have done this right if the total charge remains the same. Now, right? That's the law of conservation of charge. Now, what are those other three laws of electric charge, the ones that I was actually looking for first? Yep, Mark? Opposite charge detract. Right. And again, it doesn't matter what order you give them to me in. Opposite charges attract. That means that positive attracts negative. Negative attracts positive. Whether you have a positive object and a negative object or something as simple as a proton and an electron. The okay, opposite charges attract. Okay, what's the second one? Yep. Like charges repel. What do we mean by like charges? 
Positive and positive, negative and negative. Like charges repel each other. Repel each other means push each other apart. So like charges, if you have a positive and a positive, they're not going to come together. They're going to push each other apart. They're going to repel each other. And the third one, by the way, that's proton, proton, electron, electron. That's positive object, positive object, negative object, negative object, and so on. Any two objects, any two things that are like charges will repel each other. What's the third one? Carrie looks like you're, no? Good. Charged objects attract neutral objects. Now, that word objects is important here. Protons do not attract neutrons. Electrons don't attract neutrons. But positive objects do attract neutral objects. And negative objects do attract neutral objects. You're going to see later on today why it's important to have that word objects in there. Why protons don't attract neutrons, but positive objects do attract neutral objects. All right. Today, the focus of our discussion is going to be on how we get objects charged. How we get a negative charge on an object. Negative repels negative. Negative attracts positive. But how do we get an object to be negatively charged or to be positively charged? Okay, we know where fundamentally charge comes from. Positive objects have more protons than electrons. Negatives have more electrons than protons. But how does it get more electrons, or how does it get more protons? Okay, the first thing we got to remember here, before I uncover any of this little chart, is that when charges move, it's going to be the electrons. It's going to be the negatives. We talked about that on Thursday. The reason it's going to be the electrons is because they're the ones that are outside the nucleus. They're attracted to the nucleus. They want to stay there, but they don't want to stay there nearly as badly as the protons want to stay in the nucleus. Protons aren't going to leave. Electrons might, not necessarily, but they might leave and go from one thing to another and cause some charging to go on here. All right. There are two general categories of charging. We call them charging by conduction and charging by induction. I'm going to make a couple notes about both of them here. Charging by conduction always... Always, every single time, always involves a transfer of charge. Whereas induction never involves a transfer of charge. And by the way, when we say charge transfer, we mean electrons, right? Because if something's going to transfer, it's going to be the electrons. Conduction always involves electrons moving from one thing to another. Induction never involves electrons moving from one thing to another. Conduction usually, although not always, it usually involves touching. The reason that ch the charge will often transfer from one object to the other is usually because those two objects, if they're conductors, end up touching each other and electrons will move physically from one conductor to the other through the path that was formed when the two of them touched each other. There are situations where conduction can take place where the two objects don't touch each other. The cloud and the ground in the case of lightning being formed, the cloud and the ground aren't touching each other, but they're close enough for electrons, if the buildup is high enough, close enough for electrons to arc from the cloud to the ground. So it is possible to have conduction. Lightning, by the way, is conduction. So it is possible to have conduction taking place when the objects don't touch, as in the case of lightning, but usually it involves touching. You walk across the carpet in a dark room, stick out your finger, Okay, you rub your feet against the carpet, stick out your finger, and you touch somebody, you zap somebody. Okay? You touch them, right? Usually. Although every once in a while, if you build up enough charge on your body when you walk across the room, you can actually feel that charge transfer. You can actually feel that conduction taking place just before you make contact with the person, right? We still call it conduction in both cases. Usually it involves touching the person, but 
occasionally, sometimes, it can involve just getting close enough for the electrons to jump or to arc from one object to the other. Induction never involves touching. So if charge is transferred, it's got to be conduction. If two objects touch each other, it's got to be condu uh, conduction. If charges don't transfer, it's got to be induction. If two objects don't touch each other, it could be induction or it could be conduction, depending upon tr whether charges were actually transferred in that process or not. All right, let's provide a little bit more detail for charging by conduction now. We're going to break that down into two smaller categories. We call charging by friction and charging by contact. By the way, charging by contact, sometimes we don't even use the name contact. Sometimes we just call it charging by conduction. The subcategory, friction, is sometimes called the same thing as its parent category, conduction. Charging by friction involves rubbing things together. When you rub two dissimilar materials together, by dissimilar I mean two materials that aren't the same thing. When you rub two dissimilar materials together, one of them will tend to lose electrons easier than the other one. So when you rub two materials together, the one that loses electrons easier takes the energy from that rubbing, the kinetic energy from that rubbing, and allows and causes the electrons to leave that material and go to the other material. So rub the balloon against your hair, for instance, two dissimilar materials. I can't remember which way it is, by the way, to, that the electrons go, whether it's from the hair to the balloon or from the balloon to the hair. It doesn't really matter. One of them will lose electrons. The other one will gain electrons. That means that one of them will become negatively charged, the one that loses, sorry, the one that gains electrons, and one of them will become positively charged. That's the one that loses electrons. Again, all governed by the law of conservation of charge. The total charge when I rub the before I rub the balloon against my hair was zero. The total charge after I rub it against my hair is zero. So if one guy gains charge and becomes negative five, the other one's got to lose charge and become positive five. The total charge has to remain the same. That's charging by friction, which is a subcategory of charging by conduction. Charging by contact, we've kind of already talked about a little bit. Two objects come close enough together for either electrons to jump or they physically touch each other. That's charging by contact. What's the goal of that? We talked about that at the very beginning of class. What's the goal when these two objects touch each other or come close enough for charges to jump? They always want to, they always want to balance out. Right? Now, they don't always balance out depending upon size and shape, okay? but we assume that they do balance out. Okay? We make that assumption that it's, the objects are equal size, equal shape, they do balance out. So we're going to say for charging by contact or by conduction, um, objects touch, but I'm going to put that in quotation marks. Why am I put that in quotation marks? Why did I put that in quotation marks? Because they don't necessarily have to touch, right? They come close enough for charges to jump. That's still charging by contact. Objects touch each other. and balance out charge. And once again, that's that's uh, governed by the law of conservation of charge. Yep. Uh, no, they don't balance during friction. Um, but the law of conservation of charge still holds. Um, when you rub two objects together, let's say that they start as, off as neutral and neutral. The balloon in my hair start off as neutral and neutral. And I rub the balloon against my hair, uh, and again, I can't remember which way the electrons go. Let's say it goes from the balloon, sorry, from my hair to the balloon. If my hair was neutral and the balloon was neutral and charges were transferred, then the balloon's going to become negative something, right? Let's say it becomes negative seven. What does my hair become? Positive seven, because they have to not balance 
kind of the opposite of balance, right? When you rub them together, um, the charges become opposite because the electrons have moved from one to the other there. Does that make sense? Um, but again, the total amount of charge still remains the same. It's governed by the law of conservation of charge. Nick? Um, like yeah. Like loose charge, you mean? Yeah. Like to, to the air or something? Yeah, yeah sometimes. Yeah, that, no, that's a good question. Um, just like in the law of conservation of momentum, Nick, we avoided um, outside forces like friction and so on. We, we try to make it an isolated system so that there was no outside forces. Why do we do that? Well, because we wanted to make sure that no momentum was taken away by something. But the reality is momentum can be taken away by something, right? When you rub a balloon against your hair, sometimes you hear it crackling a little bit, right? Why is it cracking? Because the electrons are leaving. They're leaving the balloon and going into the air. They're discharging into the air. Now, if you account for that, the charge that discharged into the air, the total charge still remains the same. But the reality is when I say, look, they both start out as neutral, one becomes plus five, the other becomes minus five or whatever, that's not necessarily true because you can lose charge due to other things like the, like the air. Okay? But if you account for all that, then yeah. They, the total charge still has to remain the same. Okay? Um, again, just like in conservation of momentum, just like in those roller coaster problems we did last year with conservation of energy, we assume everything is perfect. Right? There's no outside factors that are going to take momentum or charge away. All right, charging by induction. This is our this is our way of charging by not transferring charge. How does that work? Well, let's first talk about the two subcategories of charging by induction. We can make what we call a temporary separation of charge. And we can make a permanent charge. So we can temporarily separate some charge. We can permanently make an object charge without transferring charge. I'm going to draw a couple pictures for this. Let's say you've got a let's say you've got a neutral object. Now I'm drawing it as three positives and three negatives, but it could very easily be three billion positives and three billion negatives, right? All I'm saying here is that we have an equal number of positives and negatives. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be three, it can be forty two thousand one hundred and twelve, as long as it's forty two thousand one hundred and twelve protons and electrons. It's an equal number. Neutral. We're going to bring a negatively charged object nearby. Now, I'm drawing it as all negative, but of course there's protons in there as well. I'm just saying that, look, there's more electrons than protons, so the, the object is negatively charged. Uh, I've got it drawn as a square rod or this cylindrical rod. It doesn't really matter what the shape of it is. It's a negatively charged object of some shape or another. When I bring those two things nearby, the third law of charge says they'll attract. Right? Charged objects attract neutral objects. Okay, you're going to find out in just a moment why that's the case. Let's look at the individual charges within the neutral object, object A. What's going to happen to the protons within object A? as a result of this negatively charged object coming nearby. Yep. So what are they going to do to try to neutralize the negative one? Let's assume that they can't jump, by the way. So they're not close enough for electrons to arc from one to the other. OK, so, so the protons are going to move to the right-hand side. Okay, it's a trick question. The protons don't move to the right-hand side. How come? The protons aren't going anywhere. The protons are staying in the nucleus of the atom they're in. It's a trick question. Every year I get the exact same answer. The protons stay where they are. So they want to go, they want to go, Hugh, to the right-hand side. They do, because they're attracted to it. But they can't, because they're more attracted to the nucleus they're in than they are to the negatives in that negatively charged object. Yep. 
Well, they would repel each other, yes. But well, once again, they're not going to go anywhere as a, as a result of that repulsion because uh, they're so tightly bound in the nucleus, they just, they just can't. All right. So now that we're done with the trick question, let me give you the real question. It's not a trick. What's going to happen to the negatives, the electrons in that neutral object? As a, result, as a result of this negatively charged rod or whatever it is coming nearby on the right-hand side. What's going to happen to these one, two, three electrons? Good, Carrie, they're going to push away. So those electrons that we have right here, one, two, three, they're going to be pushed to the left-hand side away from this negatively charged object. Now, the reality is they won't all be pushed over to the left-hand side. When we draw this, we're drawing it as a, uh, an exaggerated thing, right? an exaggerated diagram. They don't all move to the left-hand side, but the effect is the same whether they all do or not. The effect is that you get what we call a separation of charge. One side of the neutral object is negative because we have more negatives and positives, and the other side is positive because we have more positives than negatives. It's a separation of electric charge. It's temporary. It's temporary. Why? Tell me why it's temporary. Tell me why it's not going to stay this way forever. Go ahead. Good. Once we move this thing away, there's no reason for the electrons to stay pushed over to the left-hand side. They're going to, so, Carrie, you said it talked about the protons repelling each other. The electrons will repel each other to the point where they're going to be distributed around again, right? So it's going to go more or less back to the way it was before and even distribution. It's a separation of charge, but it's only temporary because when I take that charging object away, it goes back to the way it was before. What about, what about if we did this? What about if we made a neutral object again, negatives evenly distributed, and I bring this time a positive object nearby. Again, not all positive. There's lots of electrons there too, but there's more protons and electrons. What's going to happen to the protons in the neutral object now, Hugh? What's going to happen to the protons in the neutral object? They're going to stay where they are because they're so tightly bound in the nucleus, they can't go anywhere. What's going to happen to the electrons, these negatives, in the neutral object? Victoria, where are they going to go? But they're going to go towards the positive. The electrons are going to go towards the positive. So these guys, one, two, three electrons, are going to go to the right-hand side because they're attracted to this positive. And here it was that second law of the electric charge where like charges repelled each other, the negatives were repelled away from the negative object. Here the negatives are attracted to the positive object. It's that first law where opposites attract. Now we have again a separation of charge. Over here it's positive. Over here it's negative. It's temporary because when I take this away, it all goes back to the way it was before. I want you to notice one thing here. I told you a few minutes ago when we were reviewing that third law of the electric charge, charged objects attract neutral objects. I told you I'd explain why that was the case. I'm about to do that now. Take a look at both neutral objects. And they are neutral still, right? There's a separation of charge, but the overall charge is still neutral. Take a look at both of them. The side of the neutral object that's closest to the charging object, to this rectangular rod, is opposite to the rod. Look, positive is closest to the negative rod. 
The negative side is closest to the positive side. This neutral object is attracted to this negative object because of the separation of charge that occurs, making the side closest opposite. So basically we're saying charged objects are attracted to neutral objects because opposites, opposites attract. Does that make sense? Look, at, look down here. Charged objects attracted to neutral objects because, once again, negative is attracted to positive. Opposites attract. That doesn't happen with protons and neutrons because you can't get a separation of charge in neutron. You have to have a charged object to get a separation of charge, and you have to get a separation of charge in order to get attraction with that neutral object. Yep. Electrons are definitely the ones that move. Always. Uh, well, I say that always. There are exceptions to that, but not in the context of what we've been talking about. Uh, let's let me give you an example. Um, positive ions can move through the air or through liquid, right? Uh, there's no reason why a positive ion can't move. Protons can't move, but positive ions can move through the air or through through a liquid. The only atoms. The only, the only time a proton, individual proton could move itself is when you have something like a hydrogen um, nucleus. A hydrogen nucleus, nucleus consists of one proton, and the normal isotope of it has zero neutrons. So in that case, you could have a proton moving through the air because it's a hydrogen, in the context of a hydrogen nucleus, but in a solid uh, all we, like we're talking about here, solid conductors here, it's always going to be the electrons that move. Nick? Yep. Good question. Good question. Could the electrons jump over and try to balance it out? Uh, that depends. Okay, but that's a good question. It is conceivable that that could happen. Okay, if these are good enough conductors, and the air in between is a good enough conductor, and they're close enough together, and the charge buildup on this guy right here is big enough, then yeah, maybe the electrons could jump over and try to balance it out. Absolutely. But then we wouldn't have induction. Then we would have conduction, because that was a, a transfer of charge. Does that make sense? So it would become a different thing, but it could happen. Generally, we're talking about this. We'll assume that it doesn't happen, but it can. Yeah, it can. Again, if all the conditions are met, just like when you walk up to the person and you know go to touch them right after rubbing your feet on the carpet, sometimes it transfers just before you actually touch. Right? Same thing, really. It's happening there. Okay, one more thing. One more thing, and then I'm going to show you a couple of videos, and then we'll do a little bit more here. We talked about the temporary separation of charge, which led us to why charged objects attract neutral objects. How do we make it permanent? How do we make it permanent? How can you develop a permanent charge on one of these neutral objects without actually transferring charge between this charging object and the neutral object? Yep. Sorry? Okay, okay. Have it there, have the charging object there forever. You could say that. But in the end, this is still neutral, right? It's a separation of charge, but it's still neutral. So it's not actually charged at all. It's a separation of charge, but it's not actually charged. How do we make it charged without transferring charge between the two of them? We got to introduce a, go ahead. Yeah, we gotta give it a we gotta introduce a third thing. A third thing to take the charge. Like maybe the earth. Here's the earth over here. Big earth right over here. If we run a wire or some kind of conductor from the neutral object into the earth, we call it a grounding wire. It doesn't literally have to be a wire. It could be anything that's a conductor, including you, right? I told you guys when we were using the Van de Graaff generator the other day, you don't want to be standing on the ground when you're touching it at 400,000 volts because you become the grounding wire. 
these electrons want to go as far away from this charging object as they can. The, the furthest they could go away before was the left-hand side, but now they can go right down into the Earth. So those electrons, those three electrons, instead of stand there at the edge of the neutral object, now these electrons go down here into the ground. It's grounded, the extra electrons, the electrons will leave, or at least some of them will leave. What do you got here now? It's positive. That's not a separation of charge. That's just a positive object. It's not permanent yet, though. Anybody want to take a stab at what one final step we have to perform to make it permanent? So that when I take this object, object B, away, it stays positive? Okay. Yeah. Cut the ground wire. Disconnect it. Then you can take this away all you want. The electrons want to come back up into the object from the ground, but they can't because there's now not a path to go down to go up from the ground. Does that make sense? Yep. That's a good question. It is a charge transfer. So doesn't that make it conduction? That's a great question, Laura. There is charge transfer taking place within this process of induction. But if you take a look at these two objects right here, specifically this one, the thing that's doing the charging, there's not a transfer taking place. So within this phenomenon of, of, of induction, inducing a permanent charge, there is a charge transfer taking place. There is conduction taking place. But the process we still call induction, because the thing that's doing the charging doesn't have a charge transfer. Does that make sense? Good question, though. Real good question. Let's look at this one down here. Let's ground this one. What happens here? We, we can't push negatives down. Right? Negatives are attracted to this positive object right here, object B. Well, the ground or the Earth is not just an infinite sink of electrons that will, will, that will take as many electrons as you want to give it. It's an infinite source of electrons as well, which means that it can give up as many electrons as it needs to, essentially. So electrons will leave the ground. They'll come up into, they'll come up into this object. Look, now it's negative. If you cut the ground wire, you can take object B away if you want, and this object will remain positive. Once again, or there's transfer taking place there, but the overall process is still called induction because there's no transfer taking place between the objects that are doing the charging. Yep. Um, you guys are asking great questions this morning. Monday morning, first thing in the morning. Does the charge of the Earth not change because it's so big? Well, generally we, we, we assume that it does not change. But the reality is, of course, is that it does change, right? When you add a single electron to the Earth, the charge of the Earth has changed. When you take away a single electron, the charge of the Earth has changed. But it's kind of, um, it's kind of all relative, okay? If you've got an airplane, um, that's moving at 800 kilometers per hour, and the pilot changes the speed of the airplane by one kilometer per hour, it effectively doesn't matter. Okay, but if you've got your 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 little sister on her tricycle going at 1.5 kilometers per hour, and she changes her speed by one kilometer per hour, she's almost doubling her speed, right? So it's a matter of of, of relativity in a sense, right? Um, you take away charge here or add charge to the Earth, the charge of the Earth does change, but it's kind of like saying you're adding a kilometer per hour to the speed of the airplane, right? It changes so small that it's, it's not important, the amount that it changes, okay? Um, if you added that amount of charge to something else, like, it would matter a lot more, right? But to the Earth, it's kind of the 24 kilograms. It can take as many as you want, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really change the overall charge. By the way, I say we ground it by attaching a ground wire to the earth. 
we could, if this is our neutral object again, this is our negatively charged object, we could just bring another object touching it. Maybe it's a steel ball that touches it. Wouldn't that serve the same purpose? Now, what's going to happen? All these electrons right here, these three electrons, you get pushed over here. You separate them. This is positively charged. We effectively just grounded it without actually touching the ground. All right? So you don't, we talk about grounding um, in lots of parts of the world, they call it earthing not grounding. Same thing. If you ever heard an earthing wire, it's the same thing. Um, but it doesn't literally mean that it's touching the earth or touching the ground. Usually it does, but not necessarily.